Hello and welcome to the Artist Toolbox. I'm your host, Shannon McKinnon. Scott Barnum established his pottery studio in 1978 and has achieved a lot of success since then. I caught up with Scott at his studio to chat. So Scott, we are in your beautiful studio in Dundas and you've had a successful career as a potter. Your studio has been open since 1978. So I want to take it back to when Scott was five and he saw a potter. What was it about pottery that attracted you to it? I think it was seeing somebody work at the wheel. It was an art in the park day and I had to go along with my parents. Uh, and they were demonstrating leather work and, and down around the corner was this woman who was making pots and throwing pots on a wheel. And, I li and she gave me a piece of clay and I literally just sat there and watched her make pots all day. And then uh, like weeks really close on top of that experience, uh, I grew up with horses and we had to dig out the pond because you have to have a pond when you put a horse out to pasture mm -hmm. so they have access to water but they'd muck in it. And so every few years, the neighbor would come and dig it out. And up came all this clay. So I had all this clay to work with. And, and my parents, I was rural, and my parents were really taller. And there were buckets of dried up clay all over the place and muck and all kinds of stuff. And it was all fine with him. And you said throughout your life, it just kind of, pottery just was kind of always there, kind of always appeared. And an opportunity, another opportunity. I went to high school and they had, uh, it was a new art room and they had a great kiln and they had a great wheel. And then by the end of grade 10, I found out that Mohawk College, uh, which had a small satellite campus in Brantford, had a ceramic program there. Mm -hmm. And that was only a mile away. I could ride my bike over. So I started taking night, night classes at Mohawk College when I was still in high school. And then out of that, I got an opportunity to work for Potter. And then a year or so later, I opened a studio space that I could work in. So, and and it just every time another Every time I reach the point where another choice or another direction might be an option, this one kept opening up. Scott, I noticed that you have a common theme with your pieces and most of the symbols that you use are fish. So what is the significance with the fish? It started really simple. I, uh, I, was, I, I ended up, after some years, like seven years working on my own, I thought, you know, I, 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 want, I want to do more. I want to get out of here. I want to go and have an adventure. And I went to England and took a master's in ceramics. And in the, uh, in the master's program, they would bring in uh, assessors from outside the program area, sort of quite senior people in, in the field of education or curatorial work or whatever. And this great fellow who was one of my external assessors, he sort of looked at everything I was doing and said, you know, you, you would call yourself a potter, wouldn't you? And I said, yeah, no, I've made my living as a potter for seven years, that's how I got here. He said, it's good, it's great, it's good. He said, you do, you do know you're in an art college, it might not be enough. And I just sort of panicked and went, I know, I figured it out like weeks ago, what am I gonna do? And he said, you're gonna learn to decorate and, and I need to see how your head works, I need you to draw. And he said, I want you to get four of those big sketchbooks and I want them full. I'll be back in three months. I want to see what you're doing. And he said, my advice to you is to head down to the market. Uh, and Cardiff being a big uh, coastal city in a European British uh, city has a great big old central market. The only thing I could compare it to really is like the St. Lawrence market. And the far end of the market is all fish. After, when I got back, I carried on with the theme and what became interesting is how you could twist it or turn it or use any amount of color or pattern mm -hmm. and 
and everyone's ready to engage with it. They can see Everyone the, has their own symbolism. Well, and they can see that it's a fish, and there it is quite believable because fish actually are all kinds of different colors and patterns. Mm -hmm. And in every culture throughout the world, there's not one negative connotation. Scott, the show is called The Artist Toolbox, and this is the part of the show where I always ask the artist to give a piece of advice or a tool that they use in their craft. So Scott Burnham, what is in your toolbox? Uh, I'm gonna say advice. I'm gonna say advice. I've got scatter pottery tools, but you know, anybody who's going to Pottery Supply House is gonna find the same things. Where I think opportunity and direction come from in lots of cases is the people who I have had as mentors in my life. And I think throughout, especially my early career, I probably had three really key mentors. One was a Danish woman who was a potter that I rented my studio from. And while we never directly worked together, we worked simultaneously side by side. And it was awesome to have this parent age person. You know, you're having coffee and going, oh my God, that stop will not pay me. They never pay me. And she's going, have you called them? Yeah. And I said, well, yeah, I called last week. And she said, call them every day. Yeah. And then call them twice a day for a few days. And then call them three times a day. They'll, they'll twig. So you just you know? always had someone. There was always go. that. And then professionally, two potters in England that ended up being really key mentors in my life in terms of philosophy or uh, habits of work or ways they organize their lives or just awesomeness, you know? Well, Scott, and, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. Oh, great. It's, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. A big thank you to Scott for chatting. I highly recommend, guys, that you check out his studio. His showroom hours are every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from 12 to 5 p.m. His address is 15 Park Street, Dundas. Or you can email Scott at scott at scottbarnumpottery.com. Toolbox Resource File. Let's see what's in our toolbox today. Ah, so today's tip is for all my friends at home that want to connect more to the art community or find a space that they can really practice their art. There's two main places in Hamilton that I highly recommend you check out. The first place is called Cobalt Connects. Cobalt Connects is a nonprofit organization in Hamilton that will connect you to other creatives. If you guys want to get in contact with Cobalt Connects, you can email them at info at cobaltconnects.ca. The second place is Steel City Studio. I know Nadine personally, she's great, and they'll really give you a space that you can practice your art. For Steel City Studio, go to www.steelcitystudio.com. All these places are a great place to network, collaborate, and really get in touch with the art community. Guys, that's all for Toolbox Resource File, but don't you dare go anywhere. There's lots more coming up on the Artist Toolbox. Toolbox People. The point of Toolbox People is to highlight organizations in Hamilton that use art as a healing tool. I caught up with the Hamilton Conservatory for the Arts to see how their programs are helping children in the Hamilton community. VTech. For those who don't know, what is the Hamilton Conservatory and can you tell me a little bit about the programs? 
All right, well, let's start back. The, in 1897, a uh, conservatory decided to move to this building. From not far from here was the YMCA. They needed uh, the bigger facility and they needed the stage and performance space. So that was Unitarian Church and they then turned into the conservatory. 1903 was official opening uh, with the thousand students here and built it into 3,000 over the years. In 1997, I took over and took the big leap in, into the fate of the, the community in Hamilton, that, that the things which um, I dream about it, to make a center, resource center uh, for the arts in Hamilton here, and also place where we can display all arts can work together. So we created over 150 programs, 120, 150 programs, working right now in the music, dance, drama, visual arts. We have over 80 artists. This is the biggest place where it employs the artists all year around. And um, it's still growing, so that's the good part. Can you tell me a little bit about the programs that you offer here, like the field trips? Okay, we have programs, uh, development programs. Uh, we have system A, B, C system. So it's E introductory programs, B development programs, C celebration programs. And each one has their own kind of infrastructure and purpose. So we kind of uh, developing those programs on the needs and interests of the children. And some of them would like to have some examinations, some of them would like to be really professionally working on the stage, so that would be the C program, B program. They don't know yet, but they're in a development, they, they're still learning, and A is purely recreational, like a field trip. So each grade has different focus, like medieval, no medieval, Japan, no Japan, uh, Africa. Uh, so each one has team and story, and children acting out that story and at the same time learning what they're supposed to learn in the school. So it's a good supply thing for the teachers. We have lots of summer programs, all summer, all different programs. And then talk to the child and see what they're leaning more towards, what they enjoy the most, and this will maybe come a little direction for them. So it's not just babysitting thing or just because somebody is uh, obsessed about dance so they're gonna go. It's very good overall development for every human from, zero, uh, from two to 92. Could you tell me a little bit about Fear No Art? Uh, we do, we're trying to break the barriers of people uh, being afraid of the arts. They sing in a shower, but they, when it comes to the public or somewhere, I think they, they try and everything and say, oh, I can't do it, I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't this. Because they never try. It's learning like any other things, drawing, no drawing, is the same process. It's just you have to repeat it a few times and your passion and your, uh, uh, you know, if you follow your passion and you're excited, you don't do that for the particularly necessary to be professional or something you will find it's not that hard, it's very easy. So we created through the HG Dance Theater program uh, uh, Fear No Dance. Just to introduce people, uh, average people who never done or always wanna but never had chance to do it, or someone who done when they were young, but then when school and the family and everything, and now they wanna come back. So we try to break that barrier of impossibility and, and that fear, change from fear to faith. Yeah. Fantastic adventure, uh, trusting yourself. So you have to put a little bit of trust in yourself. If it's important, you should try, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go yourself, swim in the deep waters, you will be fine. So VTech, what's next? Where do you, what new programs are coming out? Well, we have this uh, uh, festival uh, for the Zero to Six Festival, the, uh, for young minds, a field for young minds, uh, which is called Kinderfest. The second thing we have, summer camp. Summer camp is for all ages, and and this is this is a very popular camp. Uh, we're doing that for the last 20 years, and so we kind of not perfected, but we kind of uh, developed a good good sense of what the kids would like to do in the summer. Mm -hmm. So making sure that this is lots of fun, but also they're learning something. Uh, so they come and they do lots of things at the end of the course, at the end of the week. On Fridays, they will have performance, so the parents can bring the, the, the family and they can celebrate. They, in this room, they have 
potluck, they can talk to each other, so it's very social. Mm -hmm. But uh, we believe in a celebration of learning, not just memorizing the learning. Whatever they've learned in that week, they putting together in one production, one little story, and they perform. This is very popular, and we are very proud of that development, which spread at, uh, us out throughout the year, different programs based on that kind of concept. Well, this has been wonderful. Vita, thank you, thank very you much. so much. Thanks for coming and visiting the uh, conservatory. A big thank you to the Hamilton Conservatory. Guys, you have such amazing programs going on there. To learn more about the Hamilton Conservatory or to sign up for lessons, go to their website at www.hcarts.ca. Toolbox Things. Do you love painting and want to channel your inner Picasso? I caught up with Miriam at Curry's Hamilton to see what she recommends. So Marion, why does Piñata Alcohol Inks by Jakar, why does that deserve to be in the artist toolbox? Well, the Piñata Alcohol Inks are an amazing product because of the versatile ways that you can use them. You can use them on glass, leather, wood, canvas, paper. You can use them on absolutely anything, which allows every artist to do their own thing with them. And on, when you're using with a smooth paper, such as Yupo or tear her skin, they almost glide across the paper, almost like glass as well. While if you use them with wood, they will soak in so nicely, and there are transparent colors. So I've seen people use them on wine glasses for their weddings, or stained glass, or whatever else. But seeing how one little bottle can change so many different pieces is absolutely amazing to watch. So Miriam, um, the Pinata paint does go for $4.29. What is the size of the bottle? The paint's 14 mil. Um, the extender is 28 mil, and the cleanup is 28 mil for the same price. What other paints can you combine this with? You can use these, once they're dry, you can use um, any kind of gel pen on top of them or anything like that. The Copic refills are also alcohol based and I've seen people use those with these as well, um, just because they come in little bottles as well and I've seen people use those. Um, you can do acrylic on top of it once it's dry, you can do oil on top of it once it's dry, it's really a lot of fun. Sometimes with certain products you may need to seal this um, so it doesn't blend or anything, but there are so many different ways that you can use these and other products with them. We actually got to play with the pinata paint before, which was fun. So what I'm wondering, um, for certain surfaces, do you find the paint, it takes longer to soak in? Like, do you, would you want to layer the paint? Um, it honestly depends on your surface. So for a Yupo paper, which is a plastic paper, it actually sits on top and it goes right kind of glides. For something like a porous wood, that wood's really going to soak it in, or a watercolor paper, that's really going to soak it in. It honestly depends on your surface, but it's absolutely gorgeous to use because of how it glides, you control it. So, and you can play around with it too. If you use the extender with it, you can uh, extend the paint, make it a little bit thinner, and move it around as well in different ways, and they blend really nicely as well with it. Yeah, it's definitely, it's a beautiful paint, and I love that you can use it on any surface, pretty much. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's awesome. I had fun playing with it, so Miriam, thank you so much. Not a problem. A big thank you to Miriam for all her great advice. To learn more about Curry's, go to their website at www.curries.com. Toolbox tips. I don't have any fear in my toolbox. Sometimes if I get fear in my toolbox, I get rid of it. <laughs> so because, you know, you can, fear can stop you from doing a lot of things. And um, when I started doing decorative painting, I was fearful that I wasn't an artist, that I wasn't good enough to call myself an artist. And uh, it took me a long time to get over that. And and it's the same thing with as an aerialist too. Um, I was afraid to do it, and I got over my fears to do it. So I think, I mean, the, and the other thing is money. I was going to say is, as an artist, you're always worrying about money, and it can keep you from doing the things that you really love to do. And I think that if you pursue, it, it's a bit of a cliche, but if you pursue what you love to do, don't worry so much about the money because it will come. Um, so don't be afraid to do that. Again, that's, that's fear that holds you back. 
the business of art. Here on the Artist Toolbox, we're all about promoting and empowering creativity and the importance of artists. However, it is wise as artists to look at the business side of things and see through the eyes of the person hiring and buying your art. Welcome to the business of art. Today I sat down with Chris Crawl, product owner and game designer at Prodigy, an online game that is helping kids learn math. He's here to give advice for aspiring game designers. So Prodigy is a game that uses math as the fuel for your adventures. So in the game you play as a wizard and you're wandering around in the world. Um, and you fight monsters and you throw spells and every time you want to throw a spell you have to answer a math question. So imagine if you have a spell book and the spell book is a bunch of math questions so you need to solve the math question to make your spell work. And so you're defeating these monsters, you're fighting against the puppet master who's sort of the big evil bad guy and you're getting better and better. You get to rescue some of these monsters and add them to your team so they get to join in the combat too. And this is a what's called an MMO, which is a massively multiplayer online game world. And so there's lots and lots of kids playing at the same time. We recently hit a high point for a number of kids online in a day. It was 1.4 million in one day. So this is, this is really, you know, a really fun way to go through your math homework is to be having this grand adventure and to have your, your wizard and you're using your spell book full of math problems to, to, to advance in the world. So what we want to see from game designers is previous work. So if you haven't actually gone out and done work in the world, you should create your own game design documents and try to grab any number of these free programs that are out there that would allow you to create your own game. So there's uh, Game Maker Pro uh, and Unity, both of which are game engines that are available for anybody who's interested in, in, in designing games. Um, those, those are digital game engines that will, that will work on any, any uh, desktop computer. Or you can just make a board game out of bits and pieces, right? So make a physical game and just what we're looking for is understanding of game design, knowing how all these pieces work. Our game is a digital game, so we really would like to see that, that digital side of things. Um, so that's really key, is being able to demonstrate your understanding and ability to work with these concepts. I've been doing this for 24 years now, and it has really exploded from you know, board games and the early digital games to just really fan out across all aspects of society. Gamers are now all the way up to age 50 or 60. I'd say that most of the population identifies as people who play games, if not out and out gamers. So gamers are everywhere and so game play and the gaming game mindset is everywhere also. So we see games for military applications where they're training pilots and training soldiers and, and, and how to do things. There's surgeons who are using games uh, to track, you know, to train themselves on, on, on what to do. There's gamification techniques that we use to, uh, let's say Facebook, the number of likes that you get on a, on a social media post is a form of gamification because it's a score. And so people are using that to sort of see how that goes, right, and, and, and all these achievements and things. And so it's not just something that you walk into the toy section of a store and find games. It's all over the place. And with Prodigy, we're talking about games that are going into classrooms so that kids can be engaging with these concepts in an interactive way that is better, or at least it's a, it's a good addition to having a, a teacher writing something on a blackboard, and then now within a game, you can take that idea and do something with it and try it out and experiment and reach your own individual understanding of what that is. And that's really deep learning 
in, in, you know, in doing those things. And it's, it's, a, it's a place where you can experiment and fail and succeed and understand the difference between how you arrived at those two different destinations. No. Um, it's, it's a rapidly expanding field. Um, there's still a fair amount of resistance to the idea of playing games in the classroom as being a good use of time. Uh, but more and more and more, this is becoming understood as more and more games are being used in classrooms and teachers are finding that the, this is a very useful way to engage their students. Play lots of games, deconstruct them, understand why you were engaged or why you were not engaged. Uh, really, that's... It's, it's what I call developing the game designer mindset, where you are really looking at it and taking it apart and understanding how did all these pieces of the game come together to make something that was compelling or failed to be compelling, and think about, well, if I was going to do it, how would I do it differently? That's just sort of a general design mindset, uh, and, and we're just talking about applying it specifically to a game. Stay tuned, there's lots more coming up on the Artist Toolbox. Shannon's Story. Hello everyone and welcome to Shannon's Story. On April 21st, 2017, I attended an Earth Day and Canada's 150th birthday celebration at Eastgate Square. It was a spectacular event where over 200 elementary school children participated in an art contest where they were given a canvas, recycled fabrics, and 30 minutes to create a piece about what Canada means to them. I would have done a canvas of Justin Trudeau. Really? Canada sure is a beautiful man. I mean country. <laughs> country! I love attending these events because the, of the importance of kids and art. It's fantastic. I was recently reading an article on learningliftoff.com where they found that having art classes and events in and outside of the classroom have proven to increase creativity, improved motor skills, increased confidence and focus, leading to a greater academic performance. I can personally attest to these statistics as myself, back in 2014, um, I worked for the Hamilton Conservatory for the Arts, and once a week I would have to go to inner city schools to teach children about the importance of art and most of them came from broken homes and abused homes and they didn't know how to get out what they were feeling. And it was really beautiful to see those children express themselves, but then to hear from the schools that over time, their academic grades and performance went up, which is pretty awesome. I want to thank Craig Taylor from Taylor Marketing Network for reaching out for us. Do you have a public art event or something you want us to highlight at your school? Tweet me at the Art Toolbox and let me know. Thank you for tuning into the Artist Toolbox. Stay creative, Hamilton.